Oi, governor. <laughs> Hello, mate. Well, blimey, it's the pod people, isn't it? We're here back at you with another film review of our everybody's favourite British governor, Alfred Hitchcock. You what, mate? <laughs> I'm your rough and tumble football lad, Matisse Van Rotham. <laughs> I'm Sir Templeton the Third. Ben Sheets. Well, if it's a Cleves, your uncle? Cleveland. No Cleves, your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, isn't it? <laughs> It is all right, isn't it? We're talking about Alfred Hitchcock, the man, the boy, the balloon, the most famous silhouette in the world. Master of suspense and cookies. And horribly abusing his actresses. Yay! (laughs) Everyone's favorite problematic bae, Alfred Hitchcock. And we're talking about his penultimate film, Frenzy, released in 1972. Two? Yes. Cleve, this was uh, your pick, but it was a film that none of us have seen. What is tell us? Tell about? us about why... Uh, why did you want to watch... Why Frenzy? Alfred... Or why you wanted to watch a Hitchcock. Uh, What's special to you about Al- old Alfie? I think I think what really did it for me was probably The Ginger Dead Man, too. Uh, after that film, <laughs> I I needed I needed some clout. I needed, I needed some legitimacy. And uh, you generally can't go wrong with a Hitchcock film. So, I think we've talked about several legitimate films since oh, the Ginger Dead Man. Oh, we absolutely too. have. That's that's when that dawned on me, and since then we've talked about other films. But it, that was that was when I started really hankering for a for a classic. Well, I mean, we've been doing a horror podcast for over a year. We haven't talked about a Hitchcock yet. Yeah, um, and so. I mean, it's been a while since we've watched a movie that came out so early. Like this is early seventies. Don't have many early movies in our catalog. We'll not probably a, expand. A, not a, a ton. Little bit. Um, With me on, you will. The, this is one of what could be considered Alfred Hitchcock's few true horror movies, I think. Um, along with things like Psycho and The, the Birds. birds um, you know, Those are the big three, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah, The Birds is definitely, I think, of, of all of them, probably the most horror. If oh, it, I would say so. Psycho, Psycho is, yeah, I would agree. The Birds is definitely horror heavy, yeah. but it's so campy that it's not as horrific. Yeah. I would say. I think. I think what it is is that the Birds I might find to be more truly horror, whereas the other two also sort of fall into the thriller category as well, mm-hmm. potentially. Like the the Birds is just it's a it's a monster movie. If anything, you know, it's pretty exclusively horror. I suppose. Uh, I think in terms of style i think that psycho is more I, horrific i i think in terms of style and structure psycho is a little bit more i see uh the birds kind of sometimes as an action adventure at times yeah um, no, and it, uh, no yeah. It's, it, it is a nitpick for sure um but uh yeah frenzy uh mm-hmm. um he did one more after this i believe yes um, uh in his catalog of over 50 feature films to, over the span of his career which is uh extremely impressive so uh you want to just give the basic plot set in london there's a sex murderer on the loose um in the necktie strangler mm-hmm. strangling people Specifically, ladies with neckties and raping them. Yeah, yes, unfortunately. Um, what what uh, one woman in a bar refers to as a good juicy series of sex murders. Um, that's a direct quote that I did make a note of while we were watching the film. <laughs> yeah. So essentially, uh, there's a string of sex murders and uh, a good juicy series of sex murders. Are alcoholic shitty main character is uh falsely accused of being the killer so he kind of goes on the run while trying to discover the true killer i wouldn't say he's he's that shitty he definitely has a drinking problem i actually wanted to bring that up uh when it comes to hitchcock protagonists he is pretty drastically shittier than than other hitchcock hitchcock tends to have fairly noble protagonists in his films uh, yeah, I, I suppose so to to a degree. I don't I don't think our our protagonist uh, what's his name Richard Richard Blaney I mm-hmm. think old Dicko um, 
Old, D- that's right. They keep calling him Old Dicko, which is not a great name. I think but, it's the best name. Uh, we will exclusively refer to him as Old Dicko from now on. Old Dicko. He definitely has his problems. He's depressed. He drinks a lot. Um, he runs away from his problems. Um, he gets a little angry, but I don't think he's a particularly shitty person. Well, I think the the thing that Hitchcock does so well is tonally. Um, he while he has shitty tendencies throughout the movie, he's portrayed so lightly and with so much humor around him. I think he's still a pretty likable character. He, he is very likable. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, humor sort of uh, framing this film. Yeah, it's funny because this movie, in a lot of ways, in terms of subject matter, is one of Hitchcock's darker. Yes. If not darkest, you know? It's it, one has, of... it has a couple of particularly disturbing scenes. Yeah. Yes. At least in depiction. Like, it's you see, like, Straight so up much. has a rape scene. Yep. A very, very not Which, like not like any rape scene is comfortable, but a particularly uncomfortable rape scene, I think. Which I, is something that you don't expect to see in a film from the early seventies. Yeah, and having talked about that before on the the program with uh, Silent Night, Deadly Night, I definitely wanted to kind of bring that up in comparison because this is a scene that I do think was done very well and an example of how I feel like that sort of thing, if you are going to depict it, should. Uh, I I was extremely uncomfortable during that scene, and uh, any gratuity there was was intended to be so. You know, it was intended to be uncomfortable. Yeah, I think it, I think it does a really good job of that, and it's it's so dark in its subject matter or stuff like that. But Hitchcock does a really great job of counterbalancing it. So it's it's very dark in those scenes but he counterbalances it with a lot of playfulness a lot of humor Mm -hmm. which doesn't make it feel so overwhelming yeah you know british culture has always sort of had a a no uh, (laughs) british culture has always sort of had a knack uh towards uh almost idolizing killers you know you have like jack the ripper and and those events like Mm -hmm. they they sort of turn them into icons and they they view them in a very can or the culture can sometimes view them in a very light sense uh, and you you get that in this film a good deal, uh, and it I think in some cases it really raises the discomfort when you have the the characters in the bars talking about a a juicy string of sex murders and all that. Right. You you um it really kind of bites a little bit deeper because you've already at that point already seen the events themselves unfold, and to ha- and to to hear them so lightly addressed is disheartening. Well, I think I don't even know if that's necessarily exclusive to British culture. I think it's no, a, there's yeah. it, it it's a lot easier to find levity in something that is not directly happening to you or with people distance, you care about. Absolutely. With distance comes levity. You know, that's why Manson to a lot of people is idolized because they don't have an actual connection to the events that happen. Oh, you know? yeah. Right. I would, like, I, I, you're right. Like, I mean, American culture, I think, glorifies it even more and has more of a problem with sex uh, in its in cinema. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give that for sure. Um, the way it's framed uh, from the beginning is really interesting because right at the beginning, we had this big British speech about how they're cleaning the river of yeah, all this waste. Politician out on a soapbox yeah. giving a giving a little And then uh, it's interrupted because they, they see a dead woman's body floating in the river. <laughs> yeah, right, thought, right where the speech is. I, yeah, it just yeah. floats up in the Thames. Yeah. I, I love that juxtaposition. I thought that was really, uh, really playful. Um, and a good way to kind of counterbalance how dark seeing that actual event is, you know? Because you could easily make that just super brooding, like, right. oh, we found a body. Let's do a hard-boiled detective Super thing. dark, yeah. super dark and, and gritty. But he, he avoids that, yeah. which I, yeah. I respect. Well, Hitchcock d- certainly has a sense of humor Yeah, uh, that's apparent in a lot of his films, and he does a lot of little uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek uh, tricks like that to, to sort of counterbalance the the darkness of some of his subject matter which you know i can appreciate not every horror film has to be super grim dark and serious no i think i think that in many cases the levity just brings more contrast to the dark scenes and yeah 
you know makes them more intense well exactly and that that's not to say that this this movie is only funny because like you said or like we were talking about there is a very very uh lengthy unsettling rape scene or pretty early in the movie um so it's like there's there's ups and downs between like the the humor and then like the really dark stuff that are is obviously not supposed to be a joke uh and i think hitchcock does a really good job of balancing those things because it can be it can be hard to to balance really uh dark subject matter with lightness and have it be effective i guess and not just tonally jarring maybe the the extreme britishness of it all has something to do with that because the british are kind of funny to me (laughs) (laughs) um but i totally agree i think uh the britishness definitely helps um i definitely see like a, a lineage too with uh this movie and before it uh peeping tom Yes. Um, it does have one of the same actresses, which definitely influences um, that pull for me. But, yeah. like, in, in terms of themes, you know, with, like, sex murders, like, that movie's very similar. Uh, but that movie goes much darker than this one. I think Hitchcock made the right choice by not going quite as yeah. dark. Yeah, um, yeah. And, because... I mean, I, I think there's definitely some similar themes explored, too, but it also doesn't feel like he's ripping off Peeping Tom. Yeah, yeah, he does his own thing with it, and he differentiates himself, you know, and one of the other things I really appreciate about Hitchcock's directing here is he's super old when he directed this, you know, he's like 80s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, I think he was in his late 70s. Um, And it does not feel like an old person's movie. No, it's very current for the 70s. Yeah, it felt like he kept up with the times pretty pretty well honestly yeah there are um as a matter of fact my only real critiques for this movie were aspects of the cinematography that are very 70s feeling it's the only things that i felt like really dated this movie in a bad way primarily there's a there's a really bad there's a a zoom shot that just stuck out to me pretty pretty poorly (laughs) and it's punch-ins i mean there's some set very 70s punch-ins but that's Mm -hmm. just so emblematic of of the time um i i know that this film was shot mostly in an area of London called Covent Garden, which was uh, an outdoor market um, that is no longer there anymore. Um, it was moved to a different location like a year or so after this movie was made. But Hitchcock wanted to make this movie theirs because his father was a uh, a fruit seller in that market. Really? So the location was sort of like an homage to his father. And there was, I guess, an old uh, vendor who was still there and remembered Hitchcock from when he was a, a boy in the market and that, like, they, they, during the production, like, they went out to dinner and caught up and stuff. So, That's you know. That's super interesting. What did you guys think of the acting in this movie? Because pretty fantastic. I thought it was solid across the board. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, from from the protagonist. The protagonist felt very genuine to me. Any of the sequences where he's uh, interacting with the the other primary characters, especially whenever he has like a fit of rage, it it always felt fairly believable to me. Um, the the anger always hit just just to the point of uh, unbelievability. Like, yeah. he, you know, like uh, when he finds out that the horse race is lost and he stomps on his pack of grapes outside in public, that felt like something that a, a person with some anger management issues would do and would have to deal yeah, with. Yeah, kind of, kind of an angry drunk, which which he is. Mm-hmm. But also, uh, it's you you get the development that he wasn't always that way like he's just in the last few years fallen on a string of really bad luck Luck, and he's very bitter Uh, about it and he's and he's bitter about it yeah exactly he's he's divorced his wife is doing very well financially the movie starts with him losing his his ex-wife um the movie starts with him losing his job because he's drinking on the job because he's drinking at the pub that he works at and the the owner thinks that he's stealing the booze um and then yeah like you said he doesn't have the money to put it on the horse race and that if he had had the money he would have won 20 to 1 odds so he would have made a shitload of money and then all of a sudden he's being blamed for 
these uh this juicy string of sex crimes that he didn't commit he's such a rich character and i think a lot of that comes down to the the great way they frame the backstory his backstory the the main dump we get of that is in a scene where he's eating dinner with his ex-wife they're sitting at the dinner table talking and he's getting increasingly aggravated over dinner. Mm -hmm. The way it's framed is, you know, you see the conversation and out of focus, you see people behind them eating and slowly as the conversation is going along, you see more and more people just staring at them. Yeah. Which I thought was so cool. Yeah. I remember bringing it up when we were watching the film, like the, the subtlety of it is is very on on point like uh even when his voice is just beginning just very lightly to get discomfortable you see the the very posh other people in this this fine restaurant kind of giving little side glances over and it's always in the background Hitch- it's never direct shots hitchcock, to those people yeah hitchcock is really good with those details He's a and surgeon. i was yeah. i was actually gonna bring that up in another scene another instance of that that i thought was really really well done is when before that when he goes to see his ex-wife at her office oh. and she's like um is like a dating she runs like a dating like service, a matchmaker like a like a matchmaking service and like giving people marriage certificates and shit like that and he goes to see her and uh while they're in the office talking she goes out and sends her secretary home um, and as the secretary is leaving, you can see it through sort of like the the opaque glass behind them. Yeah, kind of like them. a frosted glass almost. Right. Uh, as the, the secretary is leaving, uh, he starts to get mad about something and he bangs his hand on the table. And you can see in the frosted glass behind him that the secretary stops and looks towards the door. A lesser filmmaker would have cut to the secretary outside and having her look at the door, but to have that as just like a background detail, and then his wife, his ex-wife is the next one who is murdered, and so it's just all of that stuff adding to mm-hmm. the secretary thinking that he is the killer. Yeah, the protagonist is the murderer, so, and it, it's, it's yeah, so beautifully played out, too, because, like, when the secretary is being interviewed by the police, she says, yeah, I heard a, a loud slamming noise, you know, and I It was... sounded like he, well, yeah, she said it sounded like he struck her or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's such confident direction. So it makes because, him seem violent, Because yeah. it doesn't o- overemphasize any of those points. Yeah, he and, never overplays his hand. You know, that, that happens through and through this mm-hmm. movie, you know? Yeah, and it enhances Hitchcock's uh, sense of immersion so well, and... I I find it I always find it so impressive because Hitchcock has such large sets and such a grandiose um, yeah. such a grandiose uh, approach to like to his scenes and his his direction is also yeah, there's a lot of like sweeping camera shots and and things and pull ins it's very grand yeah so in in a lot of other circumstances that that grandiose feeling can take you out of the film or give an art, a sense of artificiality to it but when he has those subtle moments it just helps immerse you so well you feel like you're in the room with them it just brings those points home so yeah i always his intent is always so clear i always find hitchcock stuff very immersive for that reason because it does feel very carefully constructed um both in terms of its narrative and also like the literal sets like hitchcock was known for building very grand sets like you Mm -hmm. said but i i always find that stuff like super immersive because he had a very clear vision about what he wanted his films to be and was so meticulous about it that he made sure that every detail was there in order to put you in that world uh and I, I think he he was successful in doing that throughout his entire career. You know, you even look at like some of his much, much earlier films, like uh, the original uh, Man Who Knew Too Much before he remade it like 20 years <laughs> later or like Lifeboat or uh, Lady Di- Vanishes, or Lady like, Vanishes yeah. or Dial M for Murder, oh, yeah. which were, you know, much smaller scale than a lot of his later stuff, but that that really meticulous attitude to filmmaking and storytelling is still there. And that meticulous feeling, I think the, one of the reasons it is so successful is part of that hyper-analytical quality is directed towards realism. It's always, what you know, like, what is that exact thing that a person would say in that right. moment? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, it, never, it never feels artificial for it. Well, on top of that, you know, it's, 
never overly self-serious either. Um, Hitchcock is great as, at inserting a sense of humor and more than anything, a sense of dramatic irony into the situations in his yes, movies. Yes, very To much. the point where um, they don't feel stuffy ever. You know, they don't feel too heady or anything. Well, I would, I would say that they're very economic. I would say that like the core, the core events in this film are almost exclusively based on dramatic irony. Oh, a hundred percent. It's constantly our main character being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's, I mean, this, this movie isn't a whodunit. It reveals who the killer is relatively early on. And it's revealed to be one of his friends, the first friend he goes to after he loses his job. So that's why the bad luck sort of follows him is because he's not the killer, but his friend is. So he's running in the same circle, which to me makes the film. If, yes. If you had had the same series of events with this one protagonist who was just always in the wrong place at the wrong time, it, it would have felt, felt very like unbelievable, very starch, yeah. very stalely written, um, and not very believable. But because the killer is someone he is close to, of course he would be nearby. Of course, like the people who would be getting killed off or in his periphery are affiliates right. of his. You know, like granting motive. Uh, yeah, excellent, fucking excellent. Yeah, absolutely. It felt like less coincidence and more there was more intent with that stuff you oh know? yeah i never because... felt coincidental yeah, exactly um well i would say i would say there is some of it that that is coincidence to it a doesn't certain feel extent. as much as it would with a random stranger though. right right well i think i i think that the the early events uh are very coincidental to why the police start to suspect uh Richard or old Dicko. What are some specifics of Well, uh, first of all, well let, let, let's start with the fact that his ex-wife is murdered because she's a matchmaker and the killer Bob Rusk goes to her because he's specifically looking for women that enjoy pain sexually sure but... so it's not like he's going to her because she's dicko's ex-wife the fact that he is even placed there to begin with is entirely coincidental i think it's once he's framed though that rusk starts uh sort of initiating a series of events to pin the blame on dicko sure but my counter more. my counterpoint would be if he was married to her for a decade, he would, as his friend, he would know who he used to be married. He to. also makes it very clear that sure. he, he wanted to the the villain that Bob wanted to uh, attend or uh, hire them to find uh, a a lover was because well because nobody else could well and also that no he didn't want anybody but else the, the ex but he was interested in her but the ex why well because she was his type. Yes. But the ex-wife also did not know him, even though she was married to Richard, because if you'll recall, Rusk uses a fake name with her. That is he goes, true. Oh, yeah. you're right. I forgot about that. He's, he's Mr. Robinson to her. Oh. She doesn't know him. She doesn't know that that's one of Richard's friends. Bob know, might know that Richard was married to her, but they've never been formally introduced. She doesn't know him. Yes, she does not. He rapes and kills specific women that are his quote-unquote type, and he does that to two of, you know, Richard's lovers, his ex-wife and his current girlfriend. So I, it could be argued that they both have the same taste in women, but I, I still think that the setup for all of that is largely very coincidental because rusk tells uh richard's ex-wife that he has been to other matchmakers who refuse to help him because of his unconventional tastes that's true so uh, to an extent though i definitely think it's much less coincidental than it would be it, if it was a random, random person yeah, sure yeah. So sure we'll, we'll say um coincidental but likely yeah you know like i unlikely, think i think it's there's intent behind it, which is 
the uh, the interesting part about it. Right. Well, I, I think I think that intent becomes more of a purpose as the film exactly. goes on. Exactly. hundred. I think I think the I think for Rusk the coincidence that Richard gets blamed for these murders is coincidental for Rusk, but when he realizes that he can take advantage of that and draw attention away from him, then he starts working with more of a purpose, I think. Yeah. So I, I would I that that's all that's all my point, is that the setup is mostly coincidental, but that in turn leads into a sense of purpose that would not be there if Richard and Rusk were not friends. Yeah, yeah. So true. I I do want to talk about the ending, but I want to make sure you guys. I had a couple of additional points. Yeah, yeah. I think I think there are some some sequences that that bear discussing. Uh, why don't you go next, Cleveland? Yeah. Uh, primarily for me, I did I did want to bring up one really fun. I I, I had a couple of points, but I wanted to start with uh, a really fun like specific writing aspect in the dialogue, okay. which is Bob's character, as we've mentioned before, the the murderer is a uh fruit dealer yeah, he's a, a fruit seller a fruit a fruit seller yeah well, you don't yeah he's not a fruit dealer, dealer. <laughs> you want, hey kid you want some you want some kiwis got him got him in fresh don't tell nobody oh, he's oh, got a coat full of bananas <laughs> oi, oi lad come on over here i'll show you some of these mangoes he's real sweet and fresh in there he ain't seen mangoes like this before i'll tell you what i even got a couple pineapples if you come on back here in the alley what are you buying? <laughs> what are you selling? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my point with that uh, is there is uh, a sequence where uh, he he Bob very early on gives the protagonist a box of grapes to kind of help him out. You know, we're like, hey, I see right. that you're fed. And he mentions uh, – Peeling? Peeling, that's right. The grapes. Yeah, thank and you. We had to bring this up. We uh, had to. Yeah. I had forgotten about that. Thank is, you. At the time, it's it's well before Bob is revealed to be the murderer. And so it's just this this miscellaneous friend of the protagonist saying, like, you uh, don't forget to peel your grapes. And and we're just like, what the fuck? Who peels their grapes? That is so sociopathic. Yeah, like, what I, does that mean? Uh, we, were, we were like, we were like, peeling grapes? That's some serial <laughs> killer <laughs> shit yeah. right there. Yeah, and like, we were giggling over it and and uh, saying uh, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny to have a film like a comedy or something where the the serial killer's main thing in a uh, in a Buffalo Bill sort of style like has an obsession with peeling grapes and like wore the grapes as like a, a face a mask. mask, yeah, yeah and, a, like a grape skin mask, mask, yeah. yeah it, um, it it puts the Welsh's on its skin, you know, sort of thing. <laughs> and uh, like, and uh, we were we were giggling about that, but thinking it was just like a, a just a funny offhand thing. Yeah, Maybe we were British, just doing like, a bit. We were, we were just riffing. Yeah, yeah. And and when it was revealed that he actually was the villain, we were like, oh shit, that was very intentional. That is a like, oh, he peels thing. grapes. Yeah, like he peels his grapes. Like what the fuck? <laughs> I just I loved that. I absolutely adored that about the movie. It was enough to stick out for us, but for us to still believe it was a regular person. I, right. Yeah, which made Bob that much more believable and, well, you know, that he was hard to track. A scene that I, a sequence that I want to discuss because I think it's probably my personal favorite in the film is after he has killed uh, Babs, old Dicko's girlfriend, and he tries to dispose of her body in the potato truck. Good, that was the yeah, one. Yeah, in the yeah, market. Yeah. I guess that I had seen that sequence before now. I had a very keen flashback when we were watching this to being very young and like not being able to sleep and getting out of bed and going into the living room. And my mom was watching this movie because she was a high school film teacher at the time and she did a big unit on Hitchcock. So I have very early memories of Hitchcock films, and I remember walking in on this scene of dude hiding the body in the potato truck, and I had totally forgotten about it until now, but that scene, I think, is one of the best examples of balancing the dark subject matter with the levity, because... I mean, he's hiding a, f a corpse of a murdered woman in a, in this potato truck, but it becomes almost a comedy of errors because he realizes that his uh, his tie pin that he always wears that has a, a, a diamond encrusted R on it that he's always wearing. So it's very obviously his. 
he realizes that it's fallen off in the potato truck. So he has to go back down to the truck and climbs in the back and starts looking for it. And the driver shows up and starts driving. So now mm-hmm. he's on the road trying to find his pin in this potato truck in all of these sacks of potatoes. And then all the potatoes start like tumbling out the back of the truck and like running cars off the road and shit. And it's, it's, really quite funny but at the same time also like there's a corpse in the truck too and it's not particularly funny yeah this this film does such a weird job of like kind of capturing the the mundane like it's always potato trucks and fruit dealers and uh and i think it also does a really good job to sort of humanize his character not not in a way that makes you sympathize with but him but makes him seem like a real person and not just like uh a, a like an uh an, an entity an entity like a lot of serial killers usually are like a monster you know just a pure monster but the fact that he is having such a hard time retrieving his evidence <laughs> and that he's making such a fucking mess of it uh and that you see that he's really stressing out about it too like it does a very good job of humanizing him and making him seem like a real person um, which I which I always appreciate in serial killer films that they're not just in, invincible murder machines, you know, single minded murder machines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's fun for stuff like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the Thirteenth. But I appreciate the the realism of that, and I think oh, yeah. that that whole scene is really well shot as well and well blocked. Um, and probably was not super easy to shoot in in the God, interior no, of that potato imagine? truck. Yeah. Well, the the interior of the potato truck's got to be a set. No, it, yeah, uh, like, for sure. There's no way. Like, otherwise, well, yeah, but but still, possible. to build to build a po- oh, makes the interior of a impressive. potato truck set, like, there's yeah. no way that that was that was easy, and that they were definitely at one point shooting on a highway. You know, when mm. when you're seeing the the potatoes falling out of the back, and at one point uh, her arm flops out, or her leg or something is dangling out the back of the truck as they drive by the police, and the police are like, "Oh shit, you see that?" Mm. So they start following the truck. I I don't know. I that's probably my favorite scene in the movie, just because. Yeah. Oh, it's, I agree. It's fully really done really well. It's very. It's a very technical scene that's handled extremely well yeah what i'll what i'll say about it is it's also a very long sequence it's probably 10 10 or 10 12 minutes like it's it's quite lengthy and uh your your intrigue is never lost you know and the sequence it's it's always one motive from the beginning to the end of that sequence it's him trying to get his pin back and but there are just so many little things that keep occurring and getting in his way as he tries to get it. it it's no it's a wonderful aside uh, in the film, I, you know, I, I would agree. Also, I think probably the best moment. Yeah, I will say Rusk is kind of a stupid serial killer because he always leaves his necktie behind whenever he strangles anybody. Yeah, it's kind of a dumb calling card. It doesn't even seem like it's like a calling card because dude's just like leaving his ties all over town around the necks of dead women. Like that just seems like haphazard, bad form, <laughs> just sloppy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that there's some sort of like psychological backstory to that, you know, Could like be. like with with a lot of those type, or at least from what I've learned from watching serial killer movies, it tends to be brought up that like the the serial killer has some sort of motive or purpose for that that reflects their childhood or something. Yeah. Sure, you could have a, a reason, thing with ties. a reason I, for for killing the way they do. I'm absolutely glad they didn't give us any of that oh, in this same, movie. Same. I don't, yeah, I don't think it was necessary. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. And either. I and I I don't even particularly have have a problem with his sloppiness because that potato truck scene does a really good job of making him seem like kind of a bumbling serial killer anyway and i mean like realistically that's just how a lot of like real life serial killers were you know there there are some like jack the ripper and the zodiac killer who were really methodical and meticulous and were never caught because of it or because of other reasons but like serial killers all slip up at one point or another like the myth that serial killers have high iqs is just that a myth i i think i i read something recently that in fact a lot of serial killers have what would be considered below average iq not that iq is particularly uh 
trustworthy at all. It's kind of an arbitrary scale. No, but... no, you're right. I remember doing a a, a report years back for a a, a forensics class where uh, about uh, a char- the the vampire of something is what he was referred to as. He had a body count of like seventy. Something ridiculous, but he was inevitably caught because one of his vi- he one of his victims in a park managed to convince him to to let him go and that she wouldn't tell the police. Right, and he believed her. Like, good he, lord! You look at you. And look he's at like, the- how did he get a body count that high? But like, it, it rolled just, all nat twenties. Yeah, baby. like, like she, she just like really aced her charisma check and was yeah. able just to get out of it and immediately tell the police. Uh, but well, it's like you yeah. look at you look at and you also look at somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer who multiple times his victims escaped his apartment and like went running onto the street one time even onto a like up to a cop and was like yo this dude is trying to drill a hole in my skull and Jeffrey Dahmer went up to the cops he's like nah man that's my boyfriend he's just drunk and the cops were like oh yeah okay that makes good sense I mean we are this was Milwaukee but yeah. um, it's just like serial killers are are not usually what they're portrayed in movies so I, I appreciate uh, in this movie that that whole roundabout tangent is I appreciate a a more bumbling human serial it killer it goes against the grain mm. yes. which is nice yeah like one of the only other films I can think of that that does that sort of has a weird aspect that sort of humanizes their serial killer is probably um, like Silence of the Lambs with with Buffalo Bill. Yeah, for sure. You know, and his like his cross dressing thing and and all the rest of it. Like, I mean, there's plenty of movies that that have good, interesting human killers, but I just feel like. It's, Maybe it's m- not, the mundane aspect of it. Yeah, it's it's actually. not it's not necessarily yeah. the norm. You know, a lot of horror movies make their serial killers out to be like these almost like superhuman monsters. Yeah. You know? yeah. which you know is is fine for a horror movie. You know, you got to have your monster, mm-hmm. but uh, oh yeah, and the color grading of this film reflects that too. It's it's all very neutral grays. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think um, in a, in an interview, uh, I believe Hitchcock said he was he was sort of using Vermeer as a reference uh, in Vermeer's paintings, which was interesting to me. That is interesting. I don't yeah. know if I would have drawn that connection. I wouldn't but, have either. Yeah. I don't know if it was fully successful in that front, but I think in, in, it was successful in. Uh, displaying the mundane. See, the the weird thing is is that when I think back on walking into the living room and watching that potato truck scene with my mom as like <laughs> as like an 8-year-old I must have been, I distinctly remember it being in black and white. So I don't know if like there was just a black and white version. Like my mom had a box set of Hitchcock films. And I remember most of them being in black and white, so maybe it was like a black and white box set. I'm not sure. It's a weird decision. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it is. But I mean, also that would have been like the '90s. You mm-hmm. know, she would have yeah. she would have gotten that that box set in the in the mid '90s or earlier. So I don't know. They might have decided to do just a a black and white Hitchcock box set. That could very um, well be. But uh, yeah, for some reason, I I very distinctly remember yeah. that potato truck well, scene in black yeah. and white. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like this film has its own style, but I feel like the style is so in the background in service of such an you know economical story that's so tightly crafted that it doesn't ever make emphasis of itself you know like it never puts itself at the forefront it always you know is in service of it's the story it's not a film that i would like immediately describe as like stylized yeah yeah. Um, which is fine. Not every film has to be stylized. I like stylized films. No, I think but, it's a favorite of this movie. You know, I yeah, and it's it's definitely less stylized than some of Hitchcock's earlier works, uh, specifically stuff like Psycho, which is I would say heavily stylized. The black and white helps mm-hmm. with that a lot. I, I'd I'd say it's very recognizably Hitchcock. Sure, like, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Um, and but only in the sense that it it's has, masterfully done. It has it has style, but it is not stylized. Yes, yes, it is. Nice. Uh, well I would absolutely agree with that. That's a great way to put it. Um, I think a lot of the style in this movie is done in service of the plot. You know, you have right. those scenes of dramatic irony, like the uh, 
like the assistant scene, for example, right. where it is shot in a particular way, but it's not emphasizing that. Yes. Right, exactly. Um, and that's when I say it's it has style, but it's not stylized. It's like good directors have, you know, very particular little pastiches that make it noticeably their film. And like you said, it's noticeably a Hitchcock film, whereas something that is stylized, I would say, is, is it's it's in the 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 packaging, how it looks, how it sounds, how it's shot, you know, it's uh Something stylized would be like fucking like Night of the Hunter, which is highly stylized. Or Mandy is another is a great example of a highly stylized film. Yeah. Uh, I, I think another another great example of some of Hitchcock's uh, uh, sense of humor and style is with the detective. There that is the next scene. Yeah, wanted there, to bring there up. are Same. a couple of scenes where he is at home with his wife discussing the case over yes. dinner and she is like a, a wannabe Julia Child yeah. and... Well, practicing her gourmet British cooking. Right. Which which is, well, it's actually, it's, I'm pretty sure most of the dishes are non-British and I think that's part of the gag, uh, like the martini and, and a few other things. Yeah. Like they're, <laughs> like they, that she, you know, with the salted rim and all those things. She's trying, she's trying new things, but right. her, her she's, British, like. She's uh, completely tone deaf to what, like, legitimately good food is. is. Yeah. And, um, and her husband is very, very aware of it and right. trapped in his own little hell. Well, right. That's what's so funny is, like, every time the, the dishes are just, like, repulsive or weird. Like she does, like pigs' feet at one point, mm -hmm. um, or like uh, it's not quails, but like very, very tiny little Birds. like game hens. Yeah. That it, which reminded me a lot of eraser head. We made, yeah, yeah. we made several eraser head jokes before we realized that eraser head came out five years after this movie. So it could very well have been taken from this. Honestly. Could be. Because I know the 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 uh, the process for filming Eraserhead took like five or six years. A long so. time, yeah. No, that's very true. And this film is just yet another example of why Hitchcock does, or of how Hitchcock does dialogue so well, yeah. and how his films are so primarily built around dialogue sequences, yeah. but are still just gripping. Uh, even even for a comedic moment, there there are two things going on in the scene. You know, they're and they're talking about the serial killer and they're the husband, the detective, is specifically talking about like his theories on who it is, how he's gonna track him down, etc. Bouncing and, ideas yeah, off of his wife, wife. Yeah. yeah, who who also to her credit, like has some some good points that she brings she does, up during it, which yeah. I, I liked. It made her again very human and very believable. And you you do tend to get, especially in like traditional relationships, like the 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 spouse or partner also like sort of contributing to that their their partner's field in a certain way. In the same breath, during the sequence, you're also getting this full narrative of the the horrible food being presented to the husband. So it's always, right. and that's always done just in reactions to the husband's face whenever the wife is looking away. The husband also tends to down his drinks heavily, you know, as, as a concern, which uh, brings out the alcoholistic uh, th thematic elements of the film as well. Right. Uh, which is nice. It, you, you see several people sort of using alcohol to legitimately get away from their troubles, but you also see alcohol being blamed. The way that you just have these these two narratives uh, laid over the top of each other just uh, it gives such a, a a bounty of of things to take in. Yeah, uh, that that detective I read was originally supposed to be played by Laurence Olivier, which I can't quite imagine what that would have been like. Um, I'm kind of glad it wasn't. To be I, yeah, me honest, too. I because think because I think he would have stolen the show a little bit too much. Yeah. Right. N none and of that's the actors. Not a, that's not a diss on Lawrence Olivier, yeah. but he is a big actor. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, that, if anything, that's that's to say that I think he's almost too big of a name for a part like that. And apparently the character of Rusk was also originally offered to Michael Caine. Which and... in that case is very believable. They're very similar Characters. Yeah, Barry Fo Barry Foster is who plays him in the film, uh, and he does have a very similar look to Michael Caine. Mm -hmm. But apparently, uh, and they both have the same accent and mannerisms. Similar, well. yeah, very similarly. Um, apparently, Michael Caine turned the role down because 
uh, he found the character too disgusting and reprehensible. Which makes sense, especially for that era in Michael Caine's career. He was, you know, taking on mostly fairly wholesome parts as well. I suppose so, but then I think of something like Brian De Palma's Dress to Kill, where he plays uh, a cross-dressing serial killer. When was that? Um, which... Uh, Several years after this, I think I can look up Dress to Kill. It was after this, okay. um, but it was in the 70s, I believe. Interesting. But also, like, Dress to Kill is much more... Okay, it was 1980, eight years after this. Mm -hmm. um, but also, Dress to Kill is, like, a much bloodier film than this, too. Yeah. So I guess Michael Caine just kind of came around to that and yeah. stopped being a prude. But I did see an anecdote that after refusing to play this character, several years later, Michael Caine ran into Hitchcock in a hotel and, like, tried to like say hi and like shoot the breeze with him and Hitchcock completely ignored him wouldn't, oh, wouldn't speak wouldn't speak to him dang. just because he Damn. turned down this role well you know one thing I'll say about that is obviously like it's stupid to turn down a Hitchcock role because Hitchcock has such a legacy of bangers right but, it didn't hurt Michael Caine's career at all one though. thing I will say is after in a post psycho world I would be worried playing a serial killer in a Hitchcock movie because I would feel like I would probably be pigeonholed. Get shoehorned into yep. into those roles. Anthony Perkins style. Yep. No, that's that's very fair. And like I said, turning down this role obviously did not hurt Michael Caine's career. No, absolutely. It speaks not. for and itself. Meanwhile, I haven't seen any other films with the the serial killer the actor who plays Bob yeah I don't know well. what uh, exactly you know exactly yeah, yeah. Like, that's, <laughs> like that's the thing that's like the was point. that a bad yeah. call exactly uh, speaking of being pigeonholed do we have anything else to say about the sequence with the detective and his wife <laughs> I love the the when she breaks the really hard like oh, breadsticks yeah. and it just cracks and interrupts the conversation because well, he's specifically at that moment talking about how um they found the corpse's fingers to be snapped and broken <laughs> and at that moment the wife picks up the breadsticks and oh, starts snapping right. them yeah like, like, that's right no yeah. that that's another and, like and you hear the detective system. mumble under his breath like god wish we had could go back to having regular bread in this house <laughs> yeah. that's right and that's so, such a perfect so hitchcockism um yeah let's uh i think let's go ahead and, and talk about the end of this movie um because honestly the ending is kind of where my only like real problems yeah my the movie biggest lie. problem with the movie is absolutely the ending uh at a certain point old dicko turns to uh his friend bob or as he calls him, his uncle Bob, to uh, to hide him from the police. And of course, Bob immediately goes and turns him in because he's the serial killer and he wants to take all the attention off of himself. Dicko is arrested and put on trial and sentenced to life in prison. And honestly, I would have been okay with the movie just ending there. Just ending with him going away forever and not being uh, guilty and just the serial killer being on the loose. Uh, my problem is the way that justice is ultimately brought around f does not feel realistic. Yeah, so old Dicko uh, tries to run away in the jail and he immediately falls down the stairs and hits his head, yeah. gives himself a nice little concussion. He ends up in the medical ward. Intentionally. I, I don't think it's intentional. No, he's trying to escape to kill uh, to kill Bob. That's the whole point. Is he, he takes a tumble I, down the stairs so he can get to the hospital so it's easier for him to escape. They, the detective even says as much. That's why the detective, like, leaves. Because he says, like, oh, shit, he, yeah, the, I wonder if he was trying to go to the hospital intentionally. I guess he was, then he leaves. Like, he says that in the dialogue. Maybe. I mean, I, I think some of it is still circumstance, though. Like, you can tell he's 
kind of running. Yeah, it didn't. The way he falls down those stairs and hurts himself does not seem like he's taking a fall. To well, it's, it's, I think at that point it's supposed to be ambiguous to the viewer, but then made clear after. I don't know. I don't think we're given any reason to believe that Richard is that cunning at all throughout the rest of the movie. I think that does end up being more of a coincidental circumstance that he ends up in the hospital and well, there he's, he's he is. He's so like audibly motivated to get out and kill Bob. Like, well, he I mean, is. Like, I mean, he's it nonstop. He's a, he's motivated to clear his name, and he does escape because he's in the hospital. But I don't think he planned that. And he gave a bunch of drugs to the uh, the guard. Like well, and also he has yeah the... he has he has the help of the other people in the medical ward to escape because they all put their sleeping pills in the guard's tea. But whether he planned it or not, my problem is that we see him shouting multiple times about it was Rusk, it was Rusk, it wasn't me, and then you get the shots of the detective being like, hmm. Oh yeah, no. That, and that then it's not. like it's like okay, dude, like. That's literally all it took is hearing him shouting about Rusk. And that's where the detective does find Richard later after he does escape. He goes back to Rusk's apartment and finds another murdered woman in his bed. After he starts hitting uh, the, the sheets. Right, because the protagonist I... sees the blonde hair under the sheets. Right, thinks he it's... thinks it's Rusk. Yeah, he starts beating it and then realizes that it's uh, a, a murdered woman. And then the detective... Pre-murdered. Pre-murdered, yeah. <laughs> he does not kill her. And then the detective shows up because he's been thinking about, hmm, blamed it on Rusk. Maybe Rusk has something to do with it. So he shows up and it's like, oh shit, he's going to think that old Dicko killed this woman in Rusk's apartment. But then, yeah. but then Rusk shows up with a with a very large trunk, obviously to dispose of the body. Drops the trunk on the floor. Freeze frame. Roll credits. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. It's the most abrupt, most sloppily tied off ending I've yeah, seen in a Hitchcock honestly, film. Honestly, it's I think. really just that last little bit yeah. that bothered and me. It's, I not think just like, it's not even that it fades out I, and rolls to credits. Like the credits roll over the suitcase. Like the suitcase lands right. on the floor, and then they, the credits roll yeah. over, like yeah. into the scene. It's only the really last shot when Russ come ba- comes back that really bothers me, to be honest, because I. I feel like if it would have just been the detective discovering Dicko with the body, it would have been a nice like double fake out. Yeah, I could I could see that. I I agree that is where it it does really go off the rails in yeah. the, at the very very end, but I don't know, just like the whole thing of like doubt being put on Rusk just because Dicko says, oh, it was Rusk. Like, I feel like the all, even though, yes, it was Rusk, if you're, if you're looking at this from, like, uh, a detective's perspective, all of the evidence points to this one person, and just because that person says it was somebody else doesn't really give you motivation to go look into mm-hmm. that other person, because I mean, it would... To be fair, like, he the, does get a great deal of other aspects of motivation like he learns about rusk's you know interests in the the dating establishment and yeah no that's and, true you know, like like he does gain a great deal of those well those but points. also under under an assumed name right he thinks it might be Rusk. but the secretary but is able to identify it as uh, him as Rusk, as though. was mr robinson yeah. as what he gave his name i mean there's there's other clues but it doesn't feel it as... feels shoehorned. yes that's I, honestly i think it i feels don't shoehorned. i don't think it feels short i think it it leaves a point of tension uh especially in the final scene where when the detective rounds the corner we don't know if the detective is going to feel the need to pin it on him or not because the detective's proven to be kind of incompetent at this point and he's kind of he's kind of bumbling and so you think oh shit the detective's gonna be a dipshit again and just accuse him and it's like oh wait no hey the detective actually is on the right track for once I didn't have a problem with that what I would have liked to have seen different is for Russ to have actually killed the woman in the bed like if the woman hadn't been killed yet and he came in and killed her I, I think that that could have been like uh, a lot more maybe intense or or terrifying and the detective to come in and see that um, I don't know though I mean I'd like the the ambiguity of that scene I don't think that's what bothered me about the scene I like that like I I like that the detective comes in and sees 
Dicko with the body, Mm -hmm. so it's kind of open-ended. I just wish it hadn't ended with him almost backtracking that by having Russ come back. Do you mean uh, him seeing Dicko? kill the body yeah okay okay i thought you meant russ for a second no no no, no. i mean like, I if, like if, 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 well, you if, said if, yeah you said rusk so um oh, so, but no, no i i know i know what you mean could have been interesting but no i uh, i mean you're probably right like i think I, honestly i think it was fine the way it was i just think it was it was the abruptness of it but i didn't i didn't mind the detective like coming through in the end and making that that realization I, I didn't i didn't think he was going to and i enjoyed being brought around one more time on another twist i mean for a hitchcock movie that's so tightly structured i almost wish it would have introduced some of that a little bit earlier in the movie okay and had it more of a slow discovery because it definitely feels like he discovers all of that within the last 20 30 minutes yeah no i I think so too that's why to me it kind of feels shoehorned do y'all think it was a runtime problem like the film was pretty was fairly long. Do you it think was, like it the, was two hours? Yeah, that, it, um, that like that they needed to wrap it up, you know, and they they cut the ending I'm, that short for that reason. I mean, maybe, but I I feel like that's a bad excuse. I think so too. I, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's hard to say because like I feel the rest like of the film is so well. I don't know if I I think it was that because I think the thing about Hitchcock movies is he's never telling one thing at a time. You know, mm-hmm. he's always jumping between you know, minor bits of the story. Right. And I feel like with that through line, it was just the detective through line. And I don't know what else you could add to the other storylines, really. You know, if he would have, if that would have been stuff he cut, I can't imagine everything else being the only thing he cut. You know? Yeah, I think I think it would have been. I don't know if that makes sense. No, no, I don't think anything could have been cut down in the film. I just think that it was that long. I think I think it would have been more interesting if there had been (laughs) suspicion cast on Rusk earlier in the film, and maybe do that through because we see the detective has a partner. We see them working together, but there's but by the end, it's just the one detective. Maybe have the other detective, you know, be really certain that it's Blaney and not Rusk. And then our main detective be like, I don't know, there's some suspicious stuff around this Rusk guy. You know, it, it bears it bears investigating, but it's like, oh no, all the evidence is pointing at Blaney. So if there had been that doubt cast on Rusk, it would have made more sense for the detective to be suspicious about that by the end. But I don't think that that is really well done be that stuff is all thrown in like ben said in like the last 20 minutes of the movie and i i would say that my problems don't even really kick in until like the last 10 minutes of the movie that's the point where i started to feel like well everything up to this point has felt very believable and well paced and now it's starting to feel not believable um but i i think a a big problem is that because there is no real other suspect other than Dicko for the entirety of the movie, you know, to, to then just have Rusk be shoehorned in as a suspect at the very end, which is then confirmed literally seconds before the credits roll. That's my problem. Yeah. And I don't think I personally would have had as big of a problem with any of that if the credits hadn't rolled so abruptly and really brought my attention to it. If they would have literally rolled five seconds five to ten seconds before that honestly, i would have been fine honestly, honestly yeah i agree because it would have been a nice little fake out where yeah ease the, me in. the detective <laughs> thinks he's discovered the true killer and then suddenly he finds dicko with a body right so he, mm-hmm. it's like a it's a nice fake out but it's the backtracking that kind of undermines the whole right. last 20, 30 minutes of the movie. Yeah. And like, also the detective doesn't have any backup coming. There's nothing left. Like, and Bob doesn't put up a fight. He just puts his hands up. Yeah. Like, he just walks in and drops the trunk and, and that's he says, it. Hey, you're not wearing your necktie. Roll credits. And then they do. And that's oh, it. Oh yeah. I forgot like, about like that. He just decla- uh, and, oh man, that's even worse. I forgot about the line about him not wearing the yeah. necktie. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Like, like, and it just if if it, if the movie had just like if if that final sequence had just slowed down a little bit and we could have had a chance to breathe before the credits rolled, just just a breath. I just needed to breathe. Yeah. For a either moment. either do the credits right before or have some sort of falling action after Rusk is caught. Something that wraps it up a little bit more. It's falling that, action is yeah. a nice way to put it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's what it was lacking. The denouement. Yeah. This movie Yo, needed a denouement. It did need a day new event. Here's a question I have. Okay. So as we talked about earlier, Hitchcock has such a, a series of just great movies in his filmography. You know, banger after banger, classic after classic after classic. Would you guys consider this a minor Hitchcock? No, no. I, I don't think so. I mean, it, it's hard to say because... I don't even think I can confidently say that I've seen a third of his movies. Like, I've seen a, probably a good dozen, but like I said, he's got between 50 and 60 feature-length films. His filmography is nothing to sneeze at. It's No, it's huge. Yeah, I've, I've seen maybe a dozen of his films, all told, and I haven't disliked a single one. There are some that are definitely better than others. But no, I don't I don't think I would consider this a minor Hitchcock. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's worthy interesting, of its place. Interestingly, it's the only one that got the UK equivalent of an R rating when it was released. Interesting. Uh, or, or rather like an NC-17. It was a hard, you have to be 18 to see this movie. That's interesting because like the it birds... Was, I yeah. think has a few more like graphic scenes in it, like with the people with their eyes being pecked out. Right, whatnot. but I I think it was not specifically gore because there's no blood in this movie at all. It's, uh, it's the it's the subject matter yeah, and the mm, and the, like the rape scene, yeah. uh, stuff like that. Which I'll agree the, with. The, I mean, this movie is way more intense. The, than the UK birds. is strangely puritanical at times when it comes to movies. Like they they had a whole thing in the late seventies and eighties about you know video nasties right. where they would just ban. Lots of movies, including like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. A lot of those video or... nasties you still can't find to this day because they they became so obscure because of being banned. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just I just thought that was a an, an interesting yeah. little factoid. Also I- important to consider that this was one of Hitchcock's only later films that was made entirely in the uk most of his films during his career were hollywood productions yeah well it's funny too because a lot of times people consider hitchcock's very later work you know like this and marnie and a few of his like very late output to be some of his weaker stuff but i actually do agree with you guys that i don't think this is really a minor film i think this is a really strong film i would I only consider say, it minor in saying that it's lesser known i will say if i don't anything, hear people talk about I this will movie see ever it as, if anything it's mid-tier because it's not like classic on well, the same level as like you know psycho or that's anything. the thing i never sure. i never hear anybody talk about frenzy yeah you know it's not it's not mentioned in the same circles as psycho or rear window or vertigo or north by northwest or the birds or anything like that that being said i think it's still a very strong well-made intriguing murder horror film yeah um, but I a worthy guess, question. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and slap a rating on that. Yeah, it's I feel yeah, like yeah, we're, yeah. we're coming down to that. Um, yeah, other than the the end, I I thought this was a really strong movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit across the board, um, from a, a writing perspective, a directing perspective, an acting perspective. I was all extremely solid. Uh, I'm gonna give it a strong four out of five pods. Yeah. Um, I think the only major problem I had was with the uh, the the last. 20 30 minutes uh, not being as clean and tight uh tightly structured as the rest of the movie but the rest of the movie is really confidently directed it's a uh, really tonally strong hitchcock is a master of that as always and so much great dramatic irony and so much great humor in this one um yeah i'm gonna give it a four out of five as well um i think it's a great watch Ditto to all that. Four out of five. <laughs> Easy peasy. Unanimous. All right, hell yeah. yeah. Unanimous four out of five pods for Frenzy. Um, 
I like I was saying, I do think it's maybe one of his lesser known films. And if you are a, a fan of Hitchcock and this is one that you haven't seen, I would give it a strong recommendation. It's got its problems at the end, but ultimately it's a very enjoyable experience. And if you're a fan of Hitchcock's style of filmmaking, like you definitely won't be disappointed. I think I think that's something that we can definitely uh, unanimously agree on. Now I think it's time for a word from our sponsors. Oh wait, hold on. Hold on, let me, let me go get my friend uh, Clotilda. Uh, guys, I didn't tell you about this, but I do I do have uh, someone else who I wanted to give the sponsor this week. Last week was kind of a flub for me, so I figured it might be better if someone else delivers it. Oh, we're so, bringing uh, in a guest yeah, advertiser. Yeah, come on in, Clotilda. Uh, why, don't, why don't you uh, go ahead and uh, tell him about it? it? It's also it's her brand specifically. Nice so to meet you, Clotilda. To... That's Clotilda? an unfortunate name yeah, you have. I was gonna say. Settle down, settle down. Um, y- yes, <laughs> him. <clears throat> Uh, this this week, uh, our uh, your sponsorship is brought to you by Bob's Grape Peelers. Bob's Grape Peelers. Tired of those treacherous grape skins getting in the way of your snaggly, albeit majestic, British teeth? Well, fear no longer. <laughs> now you can have your gelatin. Delightful fruits in peace. Thank you. That is all. If there's one thing I know, I love eating me some grapes. But every time I eat one of them nasty buggers, the the fucking skins get caught between my teeths, isn't it? And I can't get them out because, I mean, my teeths is a is a death trap all in its own right. So thanks to Uncle Bob's grape peelers, I can peel my grapes like a true sociopath. Thanks, Uncle Bob. Wow, what a great sponsor we had this week, you guys. Excellent. 10 out of 10. Um, That'll bring us to the end of this week's episode. Um, I meant to mention it last week, but I'll, I'll do it now. Um, we're moving away from the, the mini pod format, um, just cause it feels kind of arbitrary at this point. It made sense when we started them, when we were doing like four to five movies an episode and we were doing our big episodes, but now it's just kind of whatever we're keeping it casual. So in 2019, it's all just going to be regular episodes. New year, <laughs> new us. New year, new boys. Fresh and clean, boys. If you like the show, leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get your podcasts. And hey, tell a friend. And tell a friend. Tell a British friend. Yeah. Um, tell them about Bob's grape peelers so the skins don't get caught in their teeth. <laughs> um uh follow follow us on on twitter at uh pod people pod for updates and stuff you you know what it is uh you can also follow us on letterboxd at letterboxd.com slash pod people pod for the list of all the films we talk about on the show our ratings and the links to those episodes follow me on twitter at mr van awesome or don't i'm at mr sheets I'm occasionally tweeting for Light Arc Studios, uh, and you can find my work on ArtStation, uh, just under Cleveland Mosier or Iron Prism. And uh, we'll be, you know, uh, we're continuing to, to rep it stairs back as well. Um, we've been uh, mentioning it for a while now, and uh, but by God, we're, we're making some good strides over here. And, on uh, the demo, at least. The demo's coming soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very soon. So get mm-hmm. hyped about that. Keep your eyes open and your butthole clenched. And your grapes peeled. Exactly. Um, next week, uh, we're going to be doing an, uh, a Shyamalan. We're, we're doing a Shyamalan. Glass is coming out. Shamala marathon. A Shama- Betty Black Betty is Shamalam. <laughs> yeah, a Shamala marathon. Uh, I like that. Uh, we're going to be talking the Unbreakable trilogy Gonna you know, talk about Unbreakable and Split and the new Glass that's coming out. Um, the, with the Glass Glass. The Glass the Glass. Yeah, the you know, glass. for your hot Dr. Pepper. Yep. <laughs> um, so yeah, look forward to that, you Shyamalan aficionados or whatever. 
Um, all seven of you. All yeah, all seven. <laughs> um, we'll 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 catch you then. And until next time, keep your neckties tied tight, bitches. Bye.